Hello. In this problem, we are looking at a fixed, fixed bronze bar. It has been subjected to a 36 kilonewton axial force. We call it axial because it's running down the length of the member like so. Around, um, it runs directly down the longitudinal axis. And in addition to pushing on that member with that applied force, we're also going to hit it with a temperature increase of 30 degrees Celsius. Um, we're given some basic information. So the cross-sectional area of member one and of member two, that cross-sectional area is equal to 1,000 millimeters squared. And we also have a modulus of elasticity um, of 100 gigapascals. And we also have the co um, coefficient of thermal expansion and contraction. This is the one where you could say this as like 18E minus 6 strain per degree Celsius change in temperature. It's the best way to think about that notation. And we want to figure out what the reactions are. All right, um, so our first tool to solving this problem is the same as in any other problem, um, creating that free body diagram. So I'm gonna just free my body from the supports like so. Grab all that. That was not what I meant to get, but that's okay. I can work with that. Just get rid of this stuff. Move it over. And get rid of the supports. All right, let's get rid of that. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. And get rid of this and that and that. Okay, presto, free body is in progress now. All right, so when we have this structure and we're hitting it with this temperature increase, we can use ideas of superposition to get a sense for which way these reactions are gonna point. And I'm gonna do that by splitting out the behavior into thinking just about the temperature increase so we have a positive delta T temperature increase. I'm going to think about that on the left. And on the right, I'm just going to think about the applied force. We've studied both of these structures in the past. And for a, for a temperature increase in a constrained bar, the material wants to expand. It wants to elongate but the supports prevent it from doing so. We know that we have no net deformation in that structure. So both of our reaction vectors point towards the body as shown. Now let's continue another thought experiment to the right. If I just had this structure, well, and I've got fixed supports at both ends. We've already studied this one, and we know that both reactions will point in the opposite direction of the applied load. That's what's needed for equilibrium. Um, and again, for this structure, right, this deformation is also equal to zero. There is no net change in length because of these two supports, those two constraints. So we can use a simple analysis to conclude that the left support, which I'm going to call A sub X, the left support that I'm going to call A sub X, that one conclusively is going to point left to right. I know that from analyzing, like doing a qualitative anal analysis of the two subsystems. But if I look at the other end, C sub X, now I've got vectors that are pointing in opposite directions. So I don't know at this point which one of these two behaviors is going to be driving the behavior of the system? Like, is my, temp is my temperature effect going to be of a greater magnitude than my axial effect? If so, this direction is going to win. 
Okay. Conversely, if it's that 36 kilonewtons that's driving the behavior of the system, then that reaction is going to turn around and go in this direction. I'm just going to make an assumption. So there's no way to know conclusively at this point which of these behaviors is going to govern. I am going to make an assumption. I am going to assume that the temperature effect is going to um, kind of drive the behavior. So I'm going to pick this vector and I am going to assume that my C sub X reaction is pointing to the left like this. Now, again, I really encourage you to think about directions of reactions because it increases your intuition, it increases your engineering judgment. Being able to know the answer before running calcs is a really valuable skill. That said, if you get stuck or you're confused or just unsure, it's completely okay to just assume directions for reactions. Set up the problem, the math will bear you out. All right, I'm going to get rid of that layer. And I will just simplify our free body diagram up here so that we remember the important assumptions that we're making for the direction of the reactions. So under my applied load 36 kilonewtons and under my temperature effect, which I usually do is this kind of ominous cloud plus 30 degrees Celsius, we will choose to assume that A sub X the reaction of the support on the structure is pointing to the right and we are going to choose C sub X. We're going to assume that that one is pointing to the left. A sub X we're feeling pretty confident about. C sub X we're going to have to let the math bear it out. Okay, now we're ready to start partitioning this indeterminate structure into subsystems. And yes, it is an indeterminate structure. How do we know that? Well, we only have one equation of equilibrium. Summation of forces in the x direction is equal to zero. And so I could say a sub x minus 36 kilonewtons minus c sub x is equal to zero. So that is one equation of equilibrium. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have any other equations of equilibrium that will help us solve this problem. And yet I have one, two unknowns. So I take two unknowns, subtract out one equation of equilibrium. And so this structure is one degree indeterminate. All that means is that in addition to using all um, equations of equilibrium that are non-trivial. Okay, so in addition to using this equation specifically, we also need to look at deformation compatibility. And the solution technique, there are several ways to solve this particular problem, um, but the solution technique that I want you to focus on is this idea of superposition. And what I'd like to do is to break this structure or rather this free body into two different systems, okay? So in my first system, I want to keep, I'm going to do this in black ink. I want to keep my support at A. I want to keep my axial force. And I want to keep my thermal load, which again I show as this cloud. Okay. And the only thing that separates that subsystem from reality is that I'm not going to account for. I'm going to make that a little bigger, actually. I'm going to make this one look like this. And this one can be a little smaller, be a little easier. That one go like that. OK. All right, so I'm setting up two subsystems over here on the left. This is going to be called subsystem one. 
On the right, we'll call this subsystem two. And specifically what I'm doing is releasing or removing the support or constraint at C. In other words, in this thought experiment, I'm asking myself, hmm, instead of having the fixed, fixed axial member that I see, my actual member, what would happen if it was fixed free? How much deformation would result? We'll be able to determine whether there's net elongation or net shortening. Then in subsystem two, I'll want to create a companion subsystem. It is also fictitious, but I'm going to stitch the two subsystems together with a deformation compatibility equation in the last step. Specifically, what I want to do in subsystem two is apply, is I want to apply the reaction at C as if it were a load. I'll use purple for that idea. Remember from the context up above, we had assumed that C sub X was a pushing or compressive type of force. I'm going to add that right here. Boop, C sub X. Now listen this, listen um, carefully. Here's where the magic happens. These problems are not easy, by the way. This is a little more abstract than what we've covered in the past. That's why it's a little more difficult. All right, here's what I want you to listen to. In subsystem one, if I release the support at C, I can compute the net elongation or shortening for this entire length between nodes A, B, and C. I can compute the net change in length that occurs because of the combination of the axial load and the temperature change. In subsystem two, I can proportion a reaction C sub X such that the deformation that occurs in subsystem two exactly cancels out that in subsystem one. So we'll analyze these two systems separately, but when we get back to our deformation compatibility equation, I'll put that chunk over here, deformation compatibility, equation. All we're going to do is say that the deformation in subsystem one between A and C plus the deformation in subsystem two between A and C, that has to sum up to zero. How do we know that? Well, our context up here at the top shows fixed support, fixed support. That means that this undeformed length of 1,000 millimeters or one meter is going to be exactly the same after deformation. Now, all of the planes in between these extremes can and will move or translate, but the net length will remain the same before and after deformation. All right, we're ready to dig into analysis of subsystem one. I'm going to try to get all of the information we need it on the screen, but I'm going to switch to a finer pen. All right, the deformation in subsystem one between A and C is equal to my thermal deformation between A and C plus my axial deformation 
deformation, that's the NL over AE between A and B, plus my axial deformation between B and C. Why am I splitting these two last terms up into separate things? It's just because um, we have this segment and this segment, and we have different amounts of force in those two segments. All right, I'm going to zoom in a little bit and um, expand this equation. So my thermal, the first term, my thermal, that one's going to be alpha times delta T times LAC. That is our equation for thermal deformation. We want to get the full length. That'll be the full one meter. And that one is going to be a positive term because delta T is positive. OK, so a, a temperature increase will cause elongation in most engineering materials, at least all of those that have a positive coefficient of thermal expansion and contraction. That is the alpha value that you see up at the top of the screen. Okay. Next term, we want the axial deformation in member AB. And how do I figure out the normal force? Well, let me, before I get ahead of myself, so let's just write it symbolically. So my normal force in member AB times my length of member AB divided by the area and modulus of elasticity. Those are constant along the length, so I'll just leave those without subscripts. Okay, last term, my axial deformation in BC as my normal force in segment BC, my length between B and C over AE. That is our axial deformation equation in L over AE that we use so frequently. Okay, now let's get back to these free bodies. And if I want to, I'm gonna put just a random plane right here, I'll call that DD. Like I need to section my structure through DD in order to expose the internal normal force there. And so what I'm gonna do is choose to take this cut. So DD cut, let's take the, the right side of that body. We keep all of this. Remember in subsystem one, we've released the support at C, so we don't have a force here. The only applied force on the free body is the 36 kilonewtons. Here is my normal force that lives in plane DD. That tells me the normal force for all planes between A and B. I'm drawing in sub DD with the arrow pointing away from the body because I want that to be tensile by default. And very quickly, I can use an equation of equilibrium on this free body to state that N sub D D is equal to minus 36 kilonewtons or 36 kilonewtons of compression. So that's what we're going to plug in for N sub A B. OK, that's the internal force minus 36 kilonewtons. We'll come back to that in a second. I'm going to get rid of all this stuff so we can do another free body. As a reminder, you should be doing free bodies on basically every problem in the class, oftentimes more than one per problem. They are such a great tool. All right, I'm going to cut another free body. I'll call this section EE, and that's going to characterize the internal, the internal force between planes B and C. But look what happens. I'm going to choose to take the right side of the free body, and I've got no applied force. So therefore, my internal normal force has to be equal to zero. I've got nothing to balance that out. So because there is no load, no force between B and C, what that means is that not only does this term go to zero, but of course this entire expression will go to zero as well.
All right, we're ready to plug and chug through this. Delta one is equal to my alpha coefficient, 18 E minus six per degrees Celsius times a temperature increase of 30 degrees Celsius times a length of 1,000 millimeters. I'll express that as one E3 millimeters. That's the end of my first term, this thermal co um, component right here. Okay, there's my thermal term. Okay. Now, that's not what I meant to do. Let's get a different tool. There we go. Okay, now we'll add in our axial term. I'll put a pink box around this one so that you can kind of keep it straight as we go. Okay, so we add a plus sign. My internal normal force is a negative 36 kilonewtons. That's because of compression. The length between A and B that's given up above, that's shown as 300 millimeters on the given information. In the denominator, A times E. And A is one, I'm gonna do this one E3 millimeters squared. And again, this is information that's given above. So I'm just looking at, here is the cross-sectional area. Here is the modulus of elasticity. And as a reminder, a gigapascal is defined as a kilonewton per millimeter squared. That's one to memorize for sure. OK, so I've got my area 1 E3 millimeter squared and my modulus 100 kilonewtons per millimeter squared. I was trying to plan ahead with the space, but sometimes plans change, change millimeter squared. OK, and that's the end of my second term right there, this big one right there. All right. Do we get to cancel anything out on this term? You bet. So our millimeter squared go away from numerator and denominator. My kilonewtons go away, numerator and denominator. My degree Celsius go away over here. And I'm left with deformation in millimeters plus a deformation in millimeters. All right, so at this point I am the only thing left to do is my calculator operation. I'll give you a second to pause the video, do that one on your own. But the summation of the yellow box term and the pink box term will be positive 0 0.432 millimeters. OK, don't forget as you're punching that through, don't forget this all important minus sign right there. All right, so what does this tell us? This says that if you release the support at C and you only apply an axial load and a thermal change, then the result is net elongation in this fictitious subsystem, net elongation. Because our deformation compatibility equation says that subsystem one, that deformation, which we now know is elongation, plus the deformation in subsystem two, since that has to equal zero, that means that delta two has to be shortening and it has to be equal and opposite to what, um, equal and opposite to the term we just calculated in delta one. So now that we know that, now that we've done the math, we know definitively that we have net elongation, 
Remember our original thought experiment? We didn't know if the temperature change or the axial force would be driving the behavior. Now we can answer that. It's the temperature force or the temperature change that's driving the behavior. That's why there is net elongation. Okay, now at this point, we know that our assumption of C sub X is correct here. But if you assume the opposite direction, stick with the direction you originally assumed for the entire duration of the problem, and then correct it as the last step. Not a big deal. We've already hardwired our assumption for C sub X, oops, sorry about that, into our equation of equilibrium right here, right? So that is already built into our mathematical model. There's no need to change it, no need to change it. Just um, continue with the assumption. Luckily, in this example, we did assume the correct direction. So we know we're gonna be getting a positive number um, out of this for C sub X. The positive number will confirm our assumption, but let's go ahead and do the math. Just as before, we have A, B and C as those three different nodes. And this computation is going to be a lot more straightforward than the one we just completed because all we have to do is say that delta 2 is equal to in between AC, L between AC divided by AE. The reason why I don't need a separate term for this segment and this segment is because I'm doing these free bodies in my head, right? If I cut through that plane, how much force is traveling there? Oh, it's a compressive force equal to CX, our unknown. CX is our unknown. Similarly, if I take this cut between B and C, how much internal force is crossing that plane? Oh, it's still CX of compression. Okay, let's plug into this. My normal force is equal to minus for compression CX for magnitude. And if these signs are throwing you off, go ahead and draw the free body. I'll go ahead and do it. So I'll just make this plane FF. I'll just make that plane FF here in subsystem two and draw this body, draw C sub X in the direction that we assumed, draw the normal force in the tensile direction do the summation of forces in the x direction equals zero. Minus n minus c sub x is equal to zero. Therefore, n is equal to minus c sub x. That is where that minus sign is coming from. OK. Let's go ahead and finish plugging in. So our length between A and C, that is the full one meter length of the beam, but I'll continue to express that in millimeters, just because I know that in the denominator, I've got a bunch of millimeters that are gonna need to get canceled out. Okay, product of A times E, my area was one E three millimeters squared, and my modulus was 100, gigapascals. That's 100 kilonewtons per millimeter squared. So tossing that up into the numerator like that, that one goes away. That one goes away. Okay. We're ready to run this through our calculator and we can get a value of d sub 2 as follows negative 0.0. .0 one. Oh, I forgot we could cancel out the um, E3s too. It's always great when you can do that. That just leaves one over 100, which I'm just showing in decimal form here. All right, so negative, there's my negative, 0 0.01. We're going to keep our CX and then keep the units of millimeters per kilonewton. 
Okay, so think about that for a second. What is this equation telling us? It's telling us that in fictitious subsystem two, in which we've engaged in a thought experiment, we have removed the support at C, replaced it with the reaction and said, hey, the unknown reaction must be proportioned so that it completely negates the deformation we calculated in subsystem one. And so now we see there is a linear relationship between that unknown C sub X and deformation two. There's a linear relationship between um, these two. And each millimeter of deformation is correlated to each force in kilonewtons. That's one way to kind of think through what that equation is telling you. All right, and we can we can't further simplify this. So this is kind of the end of our fictitious subsystem two mathematical manipulation. Kind of zoom out so that we kind of remember the landscape of what's going on. We had subsystem one solved that, subsystem two, we solved that, and now we're ready to, for the grand finale using our deformation compatibility equation, which I will do to the left. The deformation from subsystem one between A and C, that resulted in 0 0.432 millimeters of elongation, thus the positive sign. The deformation in subsystem two between A and C is equal to minus 0 0.01 C sub X millimeters per kilonewton and all of that is equal to zero. So I'm just plugging into my deformation compatibility equation. This is when reality is kind of setting in, right? So we did these fictitious thought experiments about what would happen if this, what would happen if this. Now we're ready to kind of rein them in to reality and make our model work together as a unit. We can just solve this simple equation. So we'll move 0.432 millimeters to the right side, divide all terms by negative 0 0.01, and you will get an answer of C sub X. Actually, let me, I'm going to go ahead and do it manually just so that I know that you know how to do the units on something like this. Okay, so I'm going to move this over here. Millimeters, I'm going to divide by negative 0 0.01. And I'm going to move these millimeters per kilonewton to the other side where they inverse into kilonewtons per millimeter. Okay, so I'm just manipulating this equation. Of course, at this point, my minus signs go away. And what that means is that the direction that I assumed for C sub X is indeed correct. My millimeters cancel out and I'm able to solve for my unknown C sub X as 43.2 kilonewtons of force. What direction does it go in? Like I said, the positive sign just confirmed my assumption and our two subsystems were based on the assumptions we documented here. So since we assumed it pointed to the left, this analysis bears that out. I would most commonly use an arrow to indicate that. I think that's simpler, but if you wanted to use the global X direction, you could just put a negative sign in front of that answer. All right, a lot of work for solving reactions, right? We've got one left to go, but luckily the last one is easy. Once we know one of our unknowns, let's just plug into our force equilibrium equation. And just for the sake of space, I'm gonna do this just below. I'll do it in black pencil. So we'll say A sub X minus 36 kilonewtons minus, plug in what we just solved for, 
kilonewtons is equal to zero. Combine these two terms, flip them over to the right side of the equation, you'll see a sub x is equal to positive 79.2 kilonewtons. What does that positive sign say? That means that our assumption that was threaded throughout this entire problem was indeed correct. So I would put an exclamation point on that answer and just say that a sub x points to the right like that. Pretty cool, right? All right, so relatively challenging problem, lots of different concepts starting to come together here, including these, this really abstract process of partitioning an indeterminate structure into these fictitious thought experiment subsystems and then tying them back together with a deformation compatibility equation. Tough stuff, doesn't mean you can't do it, it just means you need to think about it a little more. Um, I hope you have enjoyed the video. Have a great, great day.